People today claim that those who believe and have enough faith have the right to be healed. That's simply not true, folks. What about Paul? Why wasn't he healed? Did he not have enough faith? It's okay if somebody suffers. It's all right. So here we are today to serve Yahweh in this capacity one more time. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open them up to Acts chapter 3. I'm hoping to be able to move through chapter 3 a little quicker than we were able to get through chapter 2, and I know you guys are hoping the same. But I think I'll be able to do that because the second part of this chapter is somewhat similar to, similar to chapter 2. It's another powerful sermon preached by Peter, kind of like the one preached on the day of Pentecost, and it carries with it some of the same astonishments or ad admonishment. So it is my hope to actually gain some ground as it pertains to moving through this chapter since it's a little bit repetitive, but I don't make any promises. So, I don't mind moving along quickly. I think maybe people think I like to go slow, but I don't mind moving along quickly. But what I don't want to do is rush things. I don't want to rush too much and leave part of the passages unattended and do the text a disservice. And um, so we'll see how it goes. But let's go ahead and read Acts chapter 3. We're going to start in Acts 3 verse 1. Read to verse 10. And then we'll start to deal with the text. Acts chapter 3 starting in verse 1. It says, Now Peter and John were going up together to the temple complex at the hour of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. And a man who was lame from his mother's womb was carried there and placed every day at the temple gate called Beautiful. So he could beg from those entering the temple complex. When he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple complex, he asked for help. And Peter, along with John, looked at him intently and he said, Look at us. So he turned to them, expecting to get something from them. But Peter said, I have neither gold, silver, nor gold, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then taking him by the right hand, he raised him up, raised him up and at once his feet and ankles became strong. So he jumped up, stood, and started to walk, and he entered the temple complex with them, walking, leaping, and praising the Almighty. All the people saw him walking and praising the Almighty, and they recognized that he was the one who used to sit and beg at the beautiful gate at the temple complex. So they were filled with awe and astonishment at what had happened to him. Now, just really quick, it probably won't be really quick, but real quick, by way of review of what has happened so far in Acts, uh, I want you guys to remember and, and keep up and track with me, so I'm just going to do kind of a review. But in Acts chapter 1, remember, the Messiah had ascended at the end of Luke. This is the second writing by Luke, but remember that the Messiah had ascended at the end of Luke. He was resurrected. And they stayed with the disciples for some time, 40 days. Mm -hmm. But then he ascended on high to the right hand of the Almighty. After he leaves, the apostles are down to one man with the death of, Ju I mean, to 11 men with the death of Judas. And so Matthias is selected. And that brings the number of apostles back up to 12. That all took place in chapter 1. Beginning in chapter 2, we see the infiltration of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles on the day of Pentecost. And we see the miraculous signs of tongues given to the apostles, giving, in the, giving, them, giving them the ability to pronounce judgment on the leaders and the unbelieving devout Jews from all nations on the day of Pentecost. Then we have the paramount preaching of Peter, an attempt to show the Jews the validity of the Messiah, and not only his validity, but also their validity. At the end of Acts chapter 2, Peter pleaded with the people to turn from their wicked ways and to start to follow Yeshua. And the results of that sermon were outstanding. They were monumental. And the number of saints added that day were 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. Following that, Luke records that the new converts had joined in a communal style of living and were very dedicated to the way of the Lord, serving each other and the apostles daily in one, in one accord. They would break bread together. Mm -hmm. They would share their possessions with one another and also join in prayer with one another daily. 
which we determined meant that they were daily in the temple at the prescribed prayer times, not only to pray, but also to hear the apostles teach. See, the Torah mandated daily worship services in the temple. Every day, the priesthood in the temple would offer two sacrifices. They would have a morning sacrifice of a lamb that would start at dawn and end by the third hour of the morning, which we will call, let's say, 6 to 9 a.m., okay? But then they also sacrificed another lamb in the evening that would start at the ninth hour of the, of the daylight portion of day, so around 3 o'clock, and then run on out. And mind you, these apostles and new converts are all participating in those appointed times every day. Yes. They're still there, all right? This is New Testament. The Messiah has died. The gospel's been preached somewhat, at least yeah. by the Messiah, yeah. all right? They're still going into the temple complex. Contrary to popular belief or assumptions, the apostles did not teach against the temple or the Levitical worship system. If it was true that the gospel message or the death of Yeshua canceled the Levitical worship system, then the apostolic community in Jerusalem at this time sure seems to be ignorant about the change. Mm -hmm. See, the truth is the gospel didn't cancel any part of Yahweh's Torah. And the Levitical worship system is part of that Torah, right. no matter how you slice it. Right. The disciples followed their master, and their master revered the temple and all of its happenings, everything that went on in it. He called the temple his father's house. Yes, he did. Yes. As a boy, he was reluctant to leave it. As an adult, he was found teaching in the temple and keeping the feast days, even the days that are not necessarily commanded by the Torah. I am of the opinion that he kept the festival of Hanukkah in, in John chapter 10. Yes. And he did that at the temple in Solomon's colonnade. All right? I think it's John 10, 10, 30 through 36, somewhere right in there. He spent the last days of his life in the temple prior to the crucifixion. He prophesied about its coming destruction only with sorrow and weeping. He removed the money changers from the temple with cords and whips, fulfilling the prophecy that his zeal for his father's house would consume him. And he did this all while proclaiming the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And last but not least, he promised to return to the temple when Jerusalem welcomes him with the words, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So to say the least, Yeshua was zealous for the temple. And since the Messiah was zealous for the temple, so were his apostles. And so they I mean, they continued to worship there, teach there, serve one another there in and around the temple. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 6 and in verse 7, Luke tells us that the preaching about the Almighty flourished. The number of the disciples in Jerusalem multiplied greatly and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. How in the world do those priests become obedient to the, faith, to the faith unless they constantly witness the disciples and the apostles moving in and out of the temple complex? They're seeing the miracles. They're seeing what's going on. They're listening to their teaching, but they become obedient to the faith because of that. Brothers and sisters, we are often told things in our walk that sound good and seem to fit our understanding, and one of those things is that the temple services have ceased. Yeah. And obviously, this has ceased now due to the temple's destruction, but not because the law was abolished, not because Yahweh didn't like his original design, not because the temple or the temple services or the temple system was faulty in any way. Like I said, Yeshua prophesied about the destruction of the temple. He knew it was going to take place, but only in anguish with mourning and weeping. He was sad about it. He wasn't glad that that was going to take place. He was sad about it. He loved the temple, and so did the apostles. And so this was a way of life for these new converts as well. Keep in mind, these people have not been converted to Christianity as you and I know it today. No, they didn't run down the street and start going to the Baptist church or the Presbyterian church or the Methodist church. That's not what happened. No. Right? These are Jewish people. And the only conversion that they have made is that they have found faith in the only begotten Son of, the, of Yahweh. And they have pledged an allegiance to Him 
all while still walking in the Torah and keeping the Hebrew faith. Amen. That is the book of Acts. Yes, all right? That's the book of Acts. So with that backdrop in mind, it brings us to Acts chapter 3 and verse 1, and I want to read it again. It says, Now Peter and John were going up together to the temple complex at the hour of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now I've just explained enough about the temple hours of prayer and times of sacrifice and the dedication that the new believers and the apostles had for the temple. So that should be clear. But that's why they're headed to the temple at 3 in the afternoon. Okay, they're going up there for the time of prayer, the evening sacrifice. But let's talk a little bit about Peter and John. Peter and John were buddies, weren't they? Pretty good buddies. It seems like they might have fished together a little bit. If we go fishing with somebody, we call them fishing buddies. Maybe they were fishing buddies. And they've probably been hanging out around each other for quite some time, I would imagine. And if not before the association with Yeshua, Definitely for the last three years during Yeshua's ministry. Mm -hmm. They were in the inner circle of the disciples. They are the son. They are the ones that were running to the tomb on the morning of the resurrection. They traveled together in the early chapters of Acts, as we will see later on. I think I was reading it a while ago. I think it's Acts chapter 8. It says that uh, Peter and John went down to speak to the people in Samaria. And they're two of the main gurus of the early apostolic sect. Now we know a lot about Peter because it seems that he's the one that talks all the time, right? We went through his whole sermon in chapter two and in his defense, he has been chosen to be the vehicle or we might say mouthpiece that Yeshua has selected to preach the gospel to the Jewish people. But that doesn't reduce John to a lesser companion. It doesn't make John any lesser than Peter. As a matter of fact, he may be just as loud and forthcoming as Peter with his words. Remember, he is the brother of James, and they were called the sons of thunder. So undoubtedly, they were men who spoke their minds and possibly spoke it quite boldly. <clears throat> but anyways, Peter and John are together, and they're going up to the temple at the second sacrificial prayer time. Remember, there are two sacrificial times to go up to the temple, and this is the second one. There were three times of prayer. Daniel talks about the three times of prayer, 9, 12, and 3, roughly. Okay, I'm just throwing some numbers out there, but only two sacrificial times that accompanied the prayer times. Right. And this is the latter, the ninth hour, the daylight portion of the day, or about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And so while I'm here, let me make mention of something. This time of day is referred to at the temple as the time of the standing prayer. The standing prayer in Hebrew is called the Amidah, all right? And, and I didn't, I'm not going to elaborate on it a whole lot, but I wanted to throw that out there, that this is the time of the standing prayer, and I want you to see how it fits as we read through these verses today, how it coincides. I'll deal with it a little bit next time I teach, but I just want to throw it out there and let and at least wet your whistle and see if you can see where it works into all this. So here they go, going about their everyday practice, Let's look at verse 2. It says, And a man who was lame from his mother's womb was carried there and placed every day at the temple gate called Beautiful so he could beg from those entering the temple complex. So Peter and John are the first two characters we see in this chapter. But here comes character number three, the lame man. Now we don't have a name for this man, but nonetheless he is a lame beggar. And he's not just become lame, by some accident or health issue, no, he has never walked, mm. right? He has been lame since birth. He has never stood on his own two feet. Mm. The verse says he was carried there and placed every day at the gate called Beautiful. So every day he came to beg. And this has been going on for quite a long time because later on in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 4 and in verse 22, it tells us that the man was over 40 years old. That's a long time to be crippled or lame, to never experience running through the field, kicking a ball, playing with other kids, climbing trees. I can't imagine what it would be like to have to be carried everywhere I needed to go my whole life. So it seems that either this man was carried to the gates for his own benefit or possibly still for his parents' benefit because they were likely still taking care of him. So somebody had to, excuse me. But nonetheless, he was brought there for a financial benefit. 
He was brought to beg. He was carried to the gate daily, and he would beg from those who entered the temple complex. How smart is that? How smart is that? I've never understood homeless people standing on the side of I-75 in the Grady Curve down there, or the 75 85 merge right there. I've never understood those people standing out there with a sign that said, we'll work for food. While all the cars rush around the corner at 70 miles an hour, somebody's standing there under a bridge saying, we'll work for food. I've never understood that. I can't understand that. I don't know about you, but if I was homeless or hungry, I would find the biggest church in the richest community that I could find, and I would go there in effort for help. Because this should be where the people have the most compassion, right? That's the idea. That's where I would be. I wouldn't be standing under a bridge asking somebody that's driving 70 miles per hour to slow down. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly what this man has done. That's exactly what he's done. He's gone to the temple where everybody is bringing their offerings, their contributions, according to their blessings, and have come to pray and repent of their sins. Their hearts are convicted and they need to repent. They've come to worship and pay their alms. Mm -hmm. And so what better place for the beggar to be than at the temple? By the way, do you know that the Bible teaches that there is forgiveness in paying alms and charity to the poor and afflicted? Yes, There's forgiveness of your sins in that? Yes. Yes. Well, it does. Matthew's taught about it extensively. And uh, you can look that up in, in the sermon archives on the website uh, or in the church library, and you can listen to it. It may help you to understand this text right here. I did it. I listened to it again, mm. and it helped me to understand this text. Mm. But anyways... That's what he has come to do. He has been placed at the wonderful entrance into the temple to beg alms from people. And he has been doing this for years, so he must be pretty good at it. So let's talk about the gate for a minute. In our English Bible, the gate that is referred, or referenced here, is the gate called Beautiful. So undoubtedly it was a beautiful gate, I guess. But there were four main gates that led into the temple complex. So which one was it? I don't think anybody's 100% sure. Scholars are uncertain about which one is in view. It could have been any of the four. But the first option that we have is the Susa Gate or the Shushan Gate that would have been in the eastern wall of the Temple Mount facing the Mount of Olives that opened up into Solomon's Colonnade. Now, I believe this is where the early converts would have gathered and also probably the gate that the apostles used. And to add to this, the ancient Christian traditions identify the Susa Gate with the beautiful gate. Mm. So I believe this is probably the one in view here. However, most of the residents of Jerusalem did not approach the temple from the east. And so that gate may not have been suitable for the beggar. Gate number two is the double holder gate. And this gate led into the temple complex from the south. And unlike the Susa Gate, the double gate had constant traffic in and out. It had the advantage of being outside the Temple Mount and would have been a good place for the beggar to sit. The third gate that we can look at was another gate that opened into the court of the, woman, the women on the east side of the temple, according to Josephus. It had richer ornamentation than the other gates, being overlaid with massive plates of silver and gold. So he may have stationed himself there for begging. It might have been a good idea. And then gate number four is the Nicanor Gate. It is also called the Corinthians, Corinthian Bronze Gate. And this gate divided the court of the women from the court of Israel. The sages of old and Josephus both mentioned this gate and its magnificent bronze ornamentation. But it doesn't seem likely to me that the priest would have let a beggar station himself inside or near the court of the women. So the point is, we really don't know which gate he was at for sure, only that it was a gate that was called Beautiful. But it's my thought that he likely was at the Susa Gate, just because I think the apostles and the new converts would have used that entrance for easy access into Solomon's Colonnade, since that, that, that's where they were often found teaching. Either way, he's there at the temple begging for cash, right? At least some sort of monetary supplement he can't work, so he needs help. So he's there begging, and here comes Peter and John. Yeah. Let's look at verse 3. It says, when 
He saw Peter and John about to enter the temple complex. He asked, he asked for help. So the beggars sitting there, probably on a mat of some sort, I would think. I'm trying to paint a picture here for you. Watching people walk by and probably calling out for alms. He's been doing this day after day for a very, very long time. Remember, he's over 40 years old. And so let's say if he started when he's 10, he's probably been at this for roughly 30 years. Every day, the same thing. Some give, some don't. But the scenery never changes for him, right? Not today, Junior. It's fixing to change. It says when he saw Peter and John walk, walk in, he asked for help. Oh my, what a surprise he's fixing to get, huh? He just wants some money. That's all he wants. He just wants some money. He's not asking for anything else. His life has been the same for many years. This is his destiny. He has always been lame, and I'm sure that he thinks he will always be lame. He probably thinks in his mind that he will be back at that very same gate tomorrow trying to collect alms from new travelers coming to worship at the temple. It's just another day. Same scenery, different people to beg from. But look at what Peter and John say in verse 4. Peter, along with John, looked at him intently, and they said, look at us. Now, every time I read this verse, and I have read it a lot here lately, every time I read this verse, I can't help but think about the movie Captain Phillips uh, with Tom Hanks in it when the Somalian soldiers got him at gunpoint right there, and he's talking to Tom Hanks, and that Somalian soldier says, look at me, I am captain now. <laughs> I can't help but think it every time I see the word look the words look at us. But let me make another and I and I think the idea that our English Bible portrays here is that Peter and John are saying, Look at me with authority, like, look at me. Look at me when I talk to you, that kind of thing. But let me make another recommendation as to what this may mean and what I think this means. It's possible that Peter and John are saying, Look at us in the sense of examine our appearance. Look at us. Examine our appearance. Look at how we're dressed. Look at our clothes. We're not rich like the other people that you're getting money from. Look at how poor we are. We're not wearing fancy clothes. We live on communal provisions, fella. We don't have any means of which we can give you. No, look at us. I think we automatically read this as if they're just being firm and trying to get, the, get his attention to look at them. But I don't necessarily think that that's it. Because if we go ahead and we read verses 5 and 6, we will see that Peter and John's argument is that they don't have anything to give. Mm -hmm. Verse 5 says, So he turned to them, expecting to get something from them. And then verse 6 says, But Peter says, I have neither silver nor gold, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Mm -hmm. Notice Peter says we don't have anything to give as it pertains to coins or silver or gold. No, they were poor. They were poor but powerful. But powerful. So they said, look at us. We have nothing of means or money. But what we do have, we're going to give to you. Yeshua taught this to his disciples to bestow alms on all those who ask of them. Right? We see it all throughout the gospel. Mm -hmm. And he often spoke of and extolled men who gave generously to the poor. And so I would imagine that no disciple of Yeshua ever passed a beggar without bestowing some kind of gift of charity on them. But in this case, there's no money there. And so he's going to get the good stuff. I want to draw your attention to the gifts of the apostles that were enacted by them throughout their ministry. As a verification of their validity and their authenticity, we have spoken in length about the gift of languages exercised by the apostles, but not much about the other gifts that they possess, like the gift of healing. When Yeshua bestowed the gift of the Holy Spirit, upon the disciples slash apostles on the, day of a, on the day of Pentecost, it was not just limited to the gift of languages. Because as we see, it was a spirit of power that also encompassed a lot of different miraculous signs and miracles that we see throughout the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. These signs and wonders were to confirm the message that was given to the apostles. The master could perform signs and miracles, and just like he could, so could they. John chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. You can go check that out. He says, whatever you ask in my name, mm -hmm. I'll do it. Mm 
The Messiah proved who he was by signs and miracles, and those same gifts were handed down to the apostles so that the message that they brought, the words they spoke, might be accompanied by signs, wonders, and mighty deeds to back up their authority. Now today, in the world that we live in, a man's ministry is not defined by mighty deeds or wonders or signs. Instead, today, we know a true ministry by its alignment with the word of Scripture, right? That's how we tell. We don't look at somebody's mighty deeds and go, mm, he's a man of God. Mm. That's not the way we do it. We look at a man's ministry, and if it aligns with the Bible, then we know that he is a, he is a true teacher of the faith. If you listen to a man speak today or follow a ministry and his words don't align with the Bible, then he is in error at best, at best. But it could be as bad as him being a false prophet or a wolf in sheep's clothing. Mm -hmm. We have to be very careful with who we listen to right. and examine what they teach. <clears throat> the reason we know that the apostles had these powers is because of verses like 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12, which says, The signs of an apostle were performed among you in all endurance, not only signs, but also wonders and miracles. <laughs> The Bible says that they had these powers. These gifts were given to this era of apostles to confirm the words that they spoke, to confirm that they were sent by the Messiah to proclaim the good news and to preach the gospel message. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 through 4 says this. It says, It was first spoken by the Lord and was con confirmed to us by those who heard him. That's speaking about the gospel message. Verse 4 says, at the same time, Yahweh also, Yahweh also testified by signs and wonders, various miracles, and distributions of gifts from the Holy Spirit according to His will. So this was, the, this was the Apostles' confirmation to all who heard them that they were legit. They were able to perform these miracles so that people would know that they had been sent out. They were sanctioned by the Messiah. They were the foundation like Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20 says, Yahweh's household was built on the, founda on the foundation of what? Apostles and prophets. The apostles and prophets. With Christ himself as the cornerstone. Amen. Right? Amen. So these apostles were the foundation, and we all know where the foundation lies at, right? It's on the bottom. It's yeah. the beginning. The yeah. foundation is beginning. The apostles are the beginning of the apostolic ministry. Mm -hmm. So the apostles were here first to confirm the message of their Lord, and they did this through signs and miracles. And one of these gifts was healing. So they were granted the ability to heal. They actually could give physical healing to the sick in order to verify that they were divine messengers sent by the Messiah. Mm. But before we get carried away with all the healings, I want to give you some biblical facts about the gifts, okay? Because there is so much confusion regarding the topic today. Mm. There are many different teachings on healings today, and the charismatic world of religion has a multitude of so-called faith healers in it. Now, I believe in the gift of healing as it pertains to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and that the gift of healing was one that belonged to the apostles. We see it exercised throughout the book of Acts. But what we don't see is the gifts exercised by anyone else after the apostolic era. Mm. I think it was limited to that time, and not only to that time, but also obviously to Yahweh's sovereignty, right? It's limited to Yahweh's sovereignty. If Yahweh's will is not to heal somebody, then the person's not healed, right. okay? Not everyone was healed. Yeah. That's a fact. They were given the gift to heal, but they didn't heal absolutely everybody that they came in contact with. Right. And also, as I read the book of Acts, I can't see where a gift of healing was ever ex exercised on behalf of an already believing person. I'll say that again. I can't see in the book of Acts where the gift of healing was ever exercised on a person who already was a believer, who had faith. Now, I'm not talking about a resurrection of the dead. We have examples of that. Eutychus, Peter's mother-in-law. There's several resurrections of the dead, okay? But I'm talking about a physical healing of a man who was already a believer. We don't see that in the book of Acts. I believe the reason this is is because every healing was meant to be assigned to an unbeliever, just like the other gifts were. 
in order to prove something, in order to bring about validation. I don't see the Apostle Paul going back to any of the churches that he started and healing people that are sick. Don't see it. The healings are always done on unbelievers. Here's a case in point, okay? Acts chapter 19. This is the beginning of the church of Ephesus, all right? We've got a bunch of sorcery going on, a bunch of divination going on in Acts chapter 19, but this is the, this is the root of Ephesus, and they're fixing to come out of this, and they're going to be the church in Ephesus, all right? But in Acts chapter 19 and verse 11, before they're converted, the Bible says that Yahweh was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even face cloths or work aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Notice that the ones who were being healed had evil spirits released from them, yeah. proving they were unbelievers to start with. They had been practicing all kinds of magic and divination, but they were being healed. And the spirits were leaving as a sign to show them, you know, this is, this is a confirmation that they're doing the right thing. You're, you're headed down the right track. This is all confirmed in verse 18 of chapter 19, which says, and many who became believers. Mm. That automatically insinuates that they were not believers prior to that. But many who became believers came confessing and disclosing their practices. If you remember in Acts chapter 19, if you read it before, they have taken all their books, they've thrown them in the street, their sorcery books and all that kind of stuff. They burn them up and they're getting rid of their evil practices, right? So these people became believers after receiving the miracle of healing. See, the miracle of the, or the gift of healing was to validate the preaching of the gospel. When this happened, many were converted, and the Lord's message prevailed and flourished. And my point is this. The gift of healing was never to be activated on behalf of the, on behalf of the saints who already believed. It was a miracle given to help people convert to the way. People today claim that those who believe and have enough faith have the right to be healed. That's simply not true, folks. What about Paul? What about Paul? Why wasn't he healed? Did he not have enough faith? It's okay if somebody suffers. It's all right. They usually quote a verse like Isaiah 53, by his stripes we're healed. That's a gross misunderstanding of that text. I've taught through Isaiah 53. That's a gross misunderstanding of that text. If you dig through the scriptures, I don't think you'll find a proof of healing after the apostolic era, and you won't find a healing outside of resurrection offered to a believer. Again, healings were signs or miracles given to unbelievers in order to convert them, in order to convince them that what they're seeing is true. It wasn't used on already believers, which is what most of your charismatic healers claim to do today. Think about the big mega churches, the Benny Hens, the Joel Hitchcocks, the Nathan Morrises, the Kenneth Copelands, all these healing churches. Think about them. These healing evangelists claim to heal the sick inside the faith. The apostles didn't do that. They didn't do that. They claim that if you have enough faith, they can heal you. But we don't see the apostles do that. Matter of fact, everybody that the apostles healed don't have faith at all. Mm. Sandy made a great point to me last night. The ones that are resurrected from the dead, they don't have any faith. They're dead. Mm -hmm. What kind of faith did they produce? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. You say, Brother TJ, you don't believe in healing? Look at me. Mm. Of course I do. Mm. I'm a walking miracle, man. Yeah. Amen. I've been healed. I know what it's like to be sick and know that your death is right around the corner. I know what that's like. I believe in healing. I believe if someone is sick, we should pray for the healing of that person. But more than that, we should pray that the will of Yahweh be done in a brother or sister's life. And we also have to believe in the sovereignty of Yahweh. Everybody leaves the sovereignty of Yahweh out. Yeah. It's all about what we want. That's right. What about what he wants? That's right. And not everybody gets healed. Right. And, and no amount of faith entitles you to be healed. I don't care how much faith you got. That doesn't entitle you to be healed. <clears throat> I hope you hear me. Yeah. It pleased Yahweh. It pleased Yahweh mm. for Paul to remain suffering in the flesh. Right. It pleased him. Yeah. 
No amount of faith entitles you to be healed. Yahweh doesn't owe you anything. He doesn't owe me anything. I believe in prayer. I believe in healing too. I believe in the power of both by righteous saints. But I don't believe that anybody should go to a local faith healer, a TV evangelist preacher, and let him talk some nonsense over you and boast about his gift that he really doesn't even possess anyway. Because nowhere in the epistles of the early church is anything said about any, anybody being anointing the, or anointing the sick or of any promise that the prayer of faith will save you outside of James chapter 5. And I've taught two sermons on that. If you want to go check those out, I think I clear that message up too. Yeah. <clears throat> you can't command or demand Yahweh to do anything. We don't have that right. That's right. You can't do that. Now, I don't mean to get off on a rabbit trail, but it, I can't stand the fact that some so-called ministers of today, preachers, of bishops, evangelists, TV pastors, whatever you want to call them, I can't stand that they get off on telling people that they can heal them by the power of their words if they only believe. <clears throat> if you only have enough faith. Mm. By the way, you don't see the apostles say that. No. Oh, if you only have enough faith. The apostles don't say that. They don't claim any pride for themselves. You go on over to verse 12 and verse 13, Acts chapter 3, and you see what Peter and John say. Peter says this. They said, they look at him and they're amazed. You know what Peter says? He says, why do you look at us like that? As if we did this. We didn't do this. The, the, father, the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the one who's healed this man. Right. They take no uh, responsibility for it. They get no pride out of it. None whatsoever. But see, these, these TV preachers that you hear out here today and these so-called faith healers, they always leave a way of escape, right? Yes. Always. What do they say? They say, well, if you have enough faith, you can be healed. But if, you don't, if, they, if they pronounce some kind of big faith healing message over top of you and prayer and all that kind of stuff and you're not healed, they let the back door open. They've got an escape route, and it goes like this. Oh, well, you just didn't have enough faith. Yeah. It wasn't the preacher's fault. It was just you didn't have enough faith. They claim that you lack faith and that's why their healing words didn't work because you didn't have a hard enough faith. You didn't believe hard enough. No, they must not have the true gift that they claim to have. If they did, why don't they empty the hospitals? Why don't you leave that mega million dollar church and get off your private jet, walk up in Emory up there and send all them people in Winship Cancer Institute to the house if you really got it. It's because you don't got it. Right. You know? Yes. The apostles, while they have the gift of healing, the gift comes from Yahweh. Yes. If you notice, the apostles only work when Yahweh works. It's not like the apostles walked around and they go, I got the gift of healing. Anybody sick? Never works like that. It didn't work like that here. It didn't work. They were, they were going to worship at the hour of prayer. They weren't going up there to heal lame man. That wasn't the intention. They're walking up there. Undoubtedly, somebody of higher authority spoke to Peter and John and said, get him up. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that all worked, but they said, get him up. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't work like that. They, don't, they have the ability to heal through, the, through, through Yahweh. They're the vehicle by which Yahweh heals the man. Mm -hmm. But they don't just walk around healing people all the time. It's not what they're doing. That's not their ministry. Their ministry is to preach the gospel of the kingdom right. to lost souls so yeah. that converted souls can be changed, or people can be changed, can be yes. converted. Yes. Not to walk around healing people. So when you see TV evangelists get up here on TV and they talk about be healed like that right there and the whole congregation falls out behind them, you should ask yourself, what am I looking at? Yeah. None of that lines up with the Scriptures. I don't see anybody in the Bible do that. Nobody does it. Everybody I see in the book of Acts that was healed didn't have faith at all. And the apostles don't have the barrier. They don't have the barrier. Peter didn't say, well, you got enough faith. I think I can get you up off that mat. Mm -hmm. Look what Peter tells the beggar in verse 6. He says, get up and walk. Mm -hmm. Get up and walk. He doesn't say, I hope you have a lot of faith. Are you going to make me and John look like two idiots? No, he says, in the name of Yeshua the Messiah, by, the, by that name, by that authority, stand up and start walking. Mm -hmm. Folks, we're talking about a man that's never stood on his feet, ever, ever. He's about to walk and leap. No physical therapy, no time to learn to walk, no braces, no churches, no re I mean, no crutches, no rehab. A true miracle. Yes. A true miracle. Yes. Yes. From lame to leaping in one second. Yes. Amen. 
brothers and sisters, don't believe the nonsense that you hear on TV. That's right. Those are wolves in sheep's clothing trying to take your money and make a name for themselves. Yep. They don't have the true gift of healing. And it's not your fault that they don't have that gift, but it is your fault if you support that ministry. Mm -hmm. I hate to end my sermon right here, <clears throat> but I don't want to keep you all night. And uh, when I teach next time, we're going to pick it back up here in verse 6. I'm not done with those people. And uh, there's so much more to tell you about the true gift of healing and this wonderful sign that was given to the apostles by the Almighty in order to glorify Yahweh's servant, Yeshua. Yes. So we will get into that in the next time I teach. But until then, take your time. Read Acts chapter 3. Keep going through it. Study it, study it, study it, study it, study it.